Chapel International presents the Overcomers Convention 2019 theme 7 for Significant Impact. Ministering at OC 2019 are Reverend Dr. Isaac Quay, Bread of Life Christian Center, Bishop Gideon Titi Ofe, Pleasant Place Church, Reverend Dr. Michael Bodin Yamiche, the Maker's House Chapel International, and Prophet Prince from Pong, Kingdom Praise Ministries USA. It's from Wednesday, 27 November to Sunday, 1st December 2019, 6 pm from Wednesday to Saturday at 9 a.m. on Sunday at the Tehila Temple Harvest Chapel International, South Tesano. Morning sessions on Friday, 29th and Saturday, 30th November with Dr. David Eldon Schroeder from the Pillar College, USA. Spread the word and don't come alone. Your host is Reverend Fitzgerald Odonko. Music by Harvest Gospel Choir and others. Oh, oh, yes, uh, charismata and ministries, diakonia, and effects, energamata. So here's how it works. In, in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, Now concerning the spiritual, spiritual matters, spiritual things, but the word gifts is not there in verse 1. Now concerning things that are spiritual, I don't want you to be unaware or ignorant. And then in verse 4, he says, There are distribution of gifts, charismata, that's there. And then there are also distributions or varieties of ministries or services. Diakonia, we get our word deacon from that. And there are varieties or distributions of effects. Energemata is the word we get energy from. Outworkings, those are three different kinds of spiritual matters that Paul is going to write about. They're not all one thing. And so if you've ever studied this and you've seen 19 gifts or 28 gifts, uh-uh, sorry, that's not what is in Scripture. Because what's happened is people have, because they see that word gifts there in verse 1, they lump everything together, manifestations and ministries and callings and gifts, and they treat it all like it's spiritual gifts. It's not. There are differences that we have looked into and we'll look into again. Okay, so that's a key idea in, in this teaching. So here's another way of looking at it. The gift passages in scripture. You've got the spiritual things, the pneumatica. You know the word for spirit is pneuma. So pneumatica are the things of the spirit. And then there are the gifts, the charismata. They're, they're listed only one place. That's in Romans 12, not 1 Corinthians 12. And then you have ministries and they're ministries and callings, and they're listed. 1 Corinthians 12 is one list. Their other ministries are listed other places. And then manifestations, which uh, are listed in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 8 to 10. And then we find other manifestations in the book of Acts, for example. But in terms of spiritual gifts, there's only one, one list of them. And a spiritual gift is the basic inner motivation which God places in each Christian to express his love to the church. Now, this is a really important idea because when you think of a gift, sometimes you say, oh, it's like a talent, right? Oh, he's gifted or she's gifted. She has a, a, a great talent for music. So a, a spiritual gift, a charisma is not a talent. It is not an ability. It's not even an activity. A charisma is how you're wired inside. It's a motivation, it's your orientation, and everything you do comes out of that motivation. Whether you're leading uh, worship, or whether you're uh, serving by parking cars, or doing the technology, or whether you're giving church governance and leadership, or preaching, or teaching, or taking care of children, or whatever you're doing, you're doing it through your spiritual gift, your motivation. It's how you are wired. And it's important to see it that way. And this list, the charismata, as I said, are listed only in Romans 12, 6 to 8. So let's look at that because I feel like we didn't really look at the Bible yesterday enough. I had it on the, te on the screen, but, but um, I want to read this passage because it's so, so important to understand it even in its context. You all know Romans 12, 1 and 2 very well. I beseech you, brothers, or I urge you by the mercies of God to present yourselves, your bodies, as a living sacrifice. And when he says bodies here, it's the word soma 
it's not the word sarx. So sarx means your flesh, but soma means your body. It's more than your flesh. It's your whole self. It's your being. So I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We probably have all memorized that and used that, those verses a lot, but that's the context for the listing of the spiritual gifts in just a few verses. He goes on to say, now, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think, but think with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God has given you. Just as each one of us has one body and many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. And then, we have different charismata, we have different gifts in the church. And then he lists them. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of the others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So those are the seven. I've used uh, different words a, a little bit here at times, but those are the seven, and they're listed in Romans 12, and the analogy that um, Paul uses here is the human body. And again, you are a member. You're not two members. You're not an arm and a foot. You're not a, 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 you know, a liver and a brain. You know, some of you think you're the brains, but we're not. We know who the head of the church is, right? Thank God. <laughs> Thank God none of us are. But we're members of the body. And so that's what Romans 12, 3 to 8 says. So the seven gifts are these. Proclaiming truth is prophesying. Serving is meeting practical needs. Teaching is clarifying truth. Exhorting is building up faith or encouraging others. Giving is entrusting assets for ministry. Managing is coordinating efforts and empathizing is sharing and removing uh, emotional uh, distress. So we went over that yesterday. And so that's basically, um, I have a couple more slides that are review, but then we'll get on to where we left off yesterday. So here's how that works, to, the three things work together. As I exercise my motivational gift, one of the seven, whichever one of it is, as I exercise my motivational gift through a ministry or a calling that God gives me, they're not the same. I list ministries and callings together because we're allowed to seek them. You're, the gift is a given. You're hardwired with it. You can't bargain with God. If he's given you the gift of serving, that's your gift. And you're hardwired with it. And praise God for servers or exhorters or givers. That's something he's given to you. That's for you. That's your spiritual DNA. But ministries, you can seek them. And even callings in the church, you can seek them. So as I exercise my gift through a ministry or calling, the Holy Spirit determines what manifestations will receive me or the person I'm ministering to the most. Several people ask the question, it's a good question, how do we know the difference between a ministry and a manifestation? The ministry is always something that God gives to you to do. He gives you a ministry to do. The manifestation is how he uses your ministry in somebody else. He manifests Jesus. <laughs> if, you're, if you're ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit and glorifying God through your, your ministry, he manifests Jesus in somebody else through a word of wisdom, through a prophecy, through a miracle, through a healing, through a word of knowledge, any of the manifestations. So 
we're going to look at this illustration that we used here uh, yesterday again. Um, an empathizer has a teaching ministry about unity in the body of Christ, and here's how this can work. An empathizer, or the gift of mercy, has a, is not, thus teaching is not her or his spiritual gift, but they're called upon as a ministry to do this. And so as he or she teaches about unity, these various different kinds of um, manifestations can occur in the people. Now these are the nine that are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, but other manifestations can occur as well that we saw in the book of Acts. Things like exalting God or being filled with tremendous joy or having new boldness to proclaim the word of God. These are manifestations that the Holy Spirit gives to people so that they can glorify Jesus through their ministries. So that's just one example of how it can work. You can you could uh, take any one of those seven and any ministry and the Lord can use those manifestations or bring about those manifestations in, in other people. So that's pretty much where we covered yesterday. Are you all with me? Okay, understanding? I, I hope so. And uh, again, I encourage you to be like the Bereans. Seek it out in scripture. You know, d don't challenge teaching based on other teaching. Challenge it on the Word of God. Challenge it on the Word of God. If this is not biblical, then I want to know it. Believe me, I want to know it. I want to be faithful to the Word of God. But I've been studying this for a long time and teaching it and generally haven't gotten a whole lot of pushback on it. Okay, so the second part of our instruction was on discovering my gift. And, and we went over the first three yesterday. Prophecy and serving and teaching. And in each case, we went over characteristics of each of those three gifts, usually about eight or nine characteristics. And then we went over misuses, how sometimes in lack of maturity, where we all start out, uh, we might misuse our spiritual gift. Uh, but as we grow, we fine tune it and we get more in touch with the Holy Spirit and we're more uh, capable of using it for his glory. Now remember, these were the seven gifts here, prophesying, serving, teaching, exhorting, giving, managing, and empathizing. Again, a couple of places I've used different words. Um, sometimes exhorting is called encouragement. Sometimes managing is called leadership uh, uh, or organizing or administrating. And empathizing is also the word for mercy. But, but so w when we're translating from Greek into English or another language, it's not always an exact science. So sometimes there are several words that are, are at play. We also talked about hindrances to discovering your gift. And I, I put them all together. This was three slides, I collapsed them into one. And this is an important slide because um, as you're teaching this to other people, sometimes you'll find people who are interested in it, but they're not gonna be able to figure out their gift. And maybe that's true for you. And, and so one of these could be a hindrance, an unresolved problem in your personal life, like a lack of forgiveness of somebody, for example, or a lack of involvement with others. You know, the gifts are not for you. They're for you to use for the body of Christ. So if you're not involved with people, if you're not serving, you'll have a hard time figuring out what your gift is. Confusion between the gifts and the various ministries in which they're exercised. And this is often the case. Attempt to imitate the ministries of others. You, you admire somebody else so much you want to be like that person. And so that person, let's say, has the gift of exhortation. But that's not your gift necessarily, but you want to be like that person. So you have a hard time figuring out what your gift is, even though you know that's probably not my gift. Um, so, uh, and then unwillingness to accept the gift that God has given to you. And I've seen this happen time and again when somebody says, well, I, I really don't, I, do, I really don't want to be a giver. I really don't want to be a prophet or, you know, I don't like the idea of being an empathizer. Well, guess what? God has a better idea for who you should be than you. I was talking to Prince last night about this again, that there, there are two there are two wrong ways of looking at ourselves, and this was just what he was preaching about last night. One is when I accept the ideas and the opinions and the labels that other people put on me. That's not right. But the other is when I accept the opinions, ideas, and labels that I put on myself. 
because I don't have the right understanding of who I am in Christ until Christ tells me who I am. And a lot of people fail to ever get that understanding of their real identity in Christ. So unwillingness to accept the gift God has given to you and then not understanding the characteristics of the seven gifts. So these are hindrances that could stop a person from really discovering their gift. So we're gonna pick it up then at exhorter. And again, I apologize if you weren't here yesterday. Um, I'm not sure if this is in the notes, but um, other people have notes and took notes, I'm sure, so you could find the characteristics and misunderstandings or, or misuses of prophecy and serving and teaching. So let's talk about the exhorter. This is the word, the Greek word is parakaleo, the word used for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Para means alongside, like parallel, and kaleo means called. So, so a, an exhorter is called to come alongside people. They're companions, they're encouragers. And they'd come alongside to build up your faith. They, they, they want you to achieve your potential. They're very future-oriented. They, they d have a desire to visualize achievement in someone's life and to prescribe steps of action. Here's how you can get into your future, your preferable future, your, your destiny. They have a tendency to avoid systems of information that lack practical application. They're not interested in just theory. If it doesn't work in real life, it's not of interest. They have an ability to see how tribulation can produce new levels of maturity. You see, some of the, like mercy, people of mercy, they don't want people to suffer at all, period. Let me try to relieve your presence. But the exhorter says, no, I think it's okay for you to suffer if you're going to grow. And we know from Paul and Peter that it is through tribulation and trials, and James as well, <laughs> those three apostles, that it is through tribulation and trials that we grow. And so they can see how this tribulation can help produce new levels of maturity. And they depend on visible acceptance when speaking to a group. They're very eye contact oriented. They want to see, are you getting it? Is it coming through? They, they like to speak to groups, large groups is great. They love to speak with small groups as well. The prophet loves to speak to a large group and likes to call people to repentance right now. The exhorter has got more of a process focus, small groups, or even one-on-one -on -one counseling. Uh, exhorters are good at that. The discovery of insights from human experience, which can be validated and amplified from scripture, is, is, is the way they approach ministry. The teacher does it the other way. They start with scripture, and then they hope they can figure out how does this apply in real life today? What are some of the things going on, you know? And what's going on in the world today? Okay, there's, there are protesters in Hong Kong, for example. but starting with today's events and then trying to see how scripture validates those ideas. They have an enjoyment with those who are eager to follow steps of action. You know, they're, they're going to give steps of action. They're going to prescribe ways for you to grow. When I began one of my ministries, uh, we hired, brought on a pastor of counseling. It was a large church and uh, we decided we wanted a pastor just to focus on counseling people. And uh, I got to know him, and he was a very, very friendly, kind guy. But some people were a little put off by one of his tactics. When people would come to see him, he would give them counsel, and then he would give them homework. Okay, you've got to do this, maybe one thing, two things, three things. But don't even call me for an appointment until you've done it. I don't want you to waste my time or yours. If all you want is a cathartic session for you to come and unload to me, but you don't plan to change, then I'm not the guy to talk to. And that's how a, an exhorter would probably handle it. They, they, are, they enjoy uh, being with people who are wanting to grow, but they don't want to waste their time with people who decide they're going to stay stuck. They have a grief when 
teaching is not accompanied by practical steps of action. They want messages to lead somewhere into a better future. And they have a delight in personal conferences that result in new insights. They, they like seminars and webinars, and they, they just are great learners, and especially like to learn about, about human growth, human potential, um, uh, psychology. These, fig, these fields are very popular with exhorters. But there are some misuses of this gift, as there are with all the gifts. Raising the expectations of others prematurely. Because the exhorter can see your future better than you do, he or she is going to encourage you, encourage you, and maybe to the point of discouragement because you say, I can't get there. But the exhorter can see, yes, you can. But they might raise your expectations a little too quickly. Or taking family time to counsel others. Counseling is hard work, and it takes time, and it's demanding emotionally and intellectually. And sometimes the family will feel like there's not enough left of, my, of the counselor, or the exhorter in my family for us. Or treating families and friends as projects rather than as persons. This can easily happen for a counselor. And we have quite a... a School of Counseling at our college. In fact, our largest major is psychology and counseling, and we have a graduate program in psychology and counseling. And it's so easy when a person is being an intern or something like that to think of people as projects, you know. So, you know, it's kind of a win-lose or, or pass-fail, uh, you know, with, with this project. When, when, you know, you're talking with a real human being, with real-life problems and situations. So in the immaturity of a, an exhorter, they can treat others like projects and then sharing private illustrations without permission and anybody who does any public speaking certainly needs to be careful here but even in personal conversations we should not use information about other people without their permission and that's why it's always safe to talk about dead people. <laughs> they never complain. You never, they're never going to sue you or anything like that. So you can do it that way. A couple other misuses. I think. Having others depend on them rather than on God and their authorities. Uh, there's this dependency issue that psychologists know about the potential of a person becoming dependent upon them rather than dependent upon God and worse than that is codependency when when the counselor becomes dependent upon the client or the person as well so that's a, a, a misuse trusting visible results rather than a true change of heart some people are pretty clever they can go, make all the right moves say all the right things for you to think that they're being helped and they're they're changing when in reality they're not and so again a, a lack a an exhorter with the lack of maturity will get snookered on that one neglecting proper emphasis on basic bible doctrines psychology is a great field some people who are christians are a little bit nervous about psychology well let me tell you what psychology is suke is the greek word and it means your soul so psychology is really soulology. I can't think of any Christian that should have a problem with that. Okay, so, but um, when teaching goes outside the bounds of Scripture into theoretical, psychological ideas that don't square with Scripture, then, then we're in danger. But let me make a distinction here. Not every truth is biblical, that not every truth, truth is true only if it's in the Bible. You have biblical truth and you have unbiblical falsehood. But in between, there's a lot of non-biblical truth. It's not in the Bible, but it's still true. The Bible, for example, doesn't tell me that water freezes at zero degrees centigrade or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's still true, okay? So it's, it's not unbiblical, it's not biblical, it's non-biblical. So there are things like that that will come up, and we need to have discernment to know whether there's something is unbiblical or non-biblical, and certainly whether something is biblical. 
And then the last misuse of this gift of exhorting is giving counsel before discerning the essence of the person or the problem. Sometimes uh, immature counselors jump to conclusions quickly. They think they've got it all figured out. They're ready to tell you how to, how to shape up and, and, and grow up. And they haven't even really heard the essence of the problem. In fact, people who do much counseling soon learn this. A person schedules an appointment. They want you to counsel them. They're very rarely going to tell you the real problem in the first session. They're going to use some smoke screen. They're going to give, they're going to give you some kind of a, a problem that's not the main thing. It might be real, but it's not the real reason that they've come for you. They want to know whether they can trust you. And so you, you treat them with honor and dignity and give them something to do, some homework, and have them come back. And probably the second time then, they'll likely confide in you um, what the real problem is. But giving counsel before discerning the essence of a person or problem can be an issue. Now, I'm quite convinced that there are exhorters in this congregation, and you have exhorters in your church, and these are very important people in the body of Christ. Okay? Let's move on. I'm talking to the computer here now. Okay. <laughs> the giver. So this is, uh, again, uh, just what, let me say here particularly, um, this is a spiritual gift. It's also a ministry, and it's also a, a command. <laughs> we are supposed to be givers in terms of ministry and practice. None of us are left out of the blessing of receiving more from God when we give more to God. That, that's a basic principle that very few Christians really practice and believe. But believe me, I know it's true. You cannot outgive God, and the more you give, the more He'll trust you with, as long as you keep giving, and, he'll, and it's just, you're just a, a, a conduit. But giving is also a spiritual gift. Some people are just hardwired, and they just enjoy giving. Now, we're not just talking about money here. We're talking about all kinds of resources. Material resources, money resources, human resources, wisdom resources. All kinds of things. So what are the characteristics? The ability to make wise purchases and investments. They're, they're good with money. They have a desire to give quietly to effective projects or ministries they, to avoid the pressure of publicity. They, they don't like being hounded for money. They, they, they have a, uh, an understanding with the Lord that he will lead them and guide them. And so they're not always the easiest people to try to raise funds from. But they want to give quietly. They don't want publicity. They don't want recognition. They don't want their name out there. But they also like to use giving to motivate others to give. Not in a public way, but they want to see the church resource. Remember, all of these gifts are to bless the church. Okay? So if it's not a blessing to the church, then it's not a spiritual gift. And so... The giver wants to see other people enjoy the benefits of giving and bless the church, whether that's a person's gift or not. They have an alertness to valid needs that others might overlook. They, they see things uh, through a different lens than many of us. And so they see needs, practical needs, financial needs that um, other people might overlook. And they enjoy meeting the needs without the pressure of appeals. They don't like to be pressured into giving because they have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and their pressure should come from the inside, not from the outside. They have joy when a gift is an answer to specific prayer. Remember we talked about the word joy before? We said gift is charisma, the word grace is charis, but they both come from the word car, the Greek word car, which is the word for joy. And so whenever you're functioning in, in your spiritual gifting, you have joy. You have joy. And this is especially true in the giver when, when that gift is an answer to specific prayer. Oh my goodness, I had this happen just a couple weeks ago. I'm involved with, in fact, I'm on my way to Uganda from here, and there's an orphanage of 1,300 children there that were involved with Caring Heart Breakthrough Ministries and 160 widows. And Bishop Paul Musisi did not even tell me this, and he's a close friend, but he didn't tell me this. 
uh, about a need that later on arose. I went to visit the, the landlord of the building in Newark, New Jersey, that our college rents from. And the owner is a Jewish businessman. And he's a good businessman, believe me. He doesn't lose money. But he does have a heart. And somebody just told him about this orphanage. They didn't tell him about a need. They just said, there's this orphanage that Dr. Schroeder's gonna go visit. And so he called me over to his office and he said, um, I just kind of like to help that orphanage. So he said, here, would you give this to the orphanage? So he gave me a $5,000 check. I sent it on to Uganda and Bishop Musisi's wife got back to me and she said, you have no idea you have no idea what this means. The food supplier is not giving us any more credit. We owe him $5,600 and we can't get food. We're running out of food in two days for all of the children. Now, this Jewish businessman, as far as I know, is not a believer, but even he had tremendous joy when I told him that his gift was solving a big problem for 1,300 children in Uganda. And so all the more, when a person is a believer and they know that their gift is an answer to prayer, they have tremendous joy. They have a dependency on partners' counsel to confirm the amount of a gift. So I think I told you yesterday my mom was a, a server and she loved hospitality and she, was, she remember, had a great memory for everybody's information. My dad was a giver. He was an introvert. He didn't like always to have the house filled with guests. <laughs> My mom was a party happening all the time, and she was inviting people all the time. But my dad was kind of an introvert. He wasn't, oh, you know. And, but he was a giver, but she did not know that. He was the manager of a Christian publishing company. And every year on New Year's Eve day, we would go, he and I, when I was even a little boy, into the publishing house, up into the third and fourth floors where it wasn't heated, and I would crawl up on these skids of, of boxes of books, and we would take inventory. And he had an incredible mathematical mind, so I would yell down to him, Dad, there are nine, nine boxes per, per row, and there are you know eight, six or eight, and then this many you know, per column, and this many books, and, and he would start doing the math, and we would come home, uh, you know, and he would have all these numbers, and he would start on a calculator, you know, figuring it out. What was the inventory? It used to drive my mom nuts. She thought he was so materialistic. He's just wanting to know. He just wants to know how the business is doing and, and he can gloat and, and we, you know, and so that was a problem between them. They didn't understand each other's spiritual gift. Everybody thought he was a manager because he was a good businessman. And when we talked about this and I shared this teaching with them and he said, he said, yep, that's me. I'm a giver. My mom said, what? He said, yeah. And she said, well, what's this about all the, he said, because I want to find out from our inventory what our net profit was from the previous year so we know how much money we can give into the missionary cause of our church. And so that completely changed her thinking about her husband of more than 40 years at that time and brought a new kind of harmony into their life. So he was definitely wanting to, uh, get in touch with, with my mom in the future about how can we work together to give to the Lord properly. Concern that the gift be high quality. They don't buy cheap, they buy quality. Desire to feel the part of a work or person that the gift goes to. They don't wanna just shell out money to a fund. They want to know who are the people that God is trusting to use these resources in ministry. And then they have a concern about stewardship as well as generosity. They want to make sure that resources are used the right way to glorify God, that there's not waste, that there's no fraud, that there's nothing amiss. They're very concerned about stewardship, but there are misuses of this gift as well. Giving too sparingly to their own family <laughs> because they're so motivated about missions and so on, or causing family to resent gifts to others. So. We, we, we often talk about the importance of the family, but in the immaturity of our spiritual gifting, we can create friction in our families if we're not careful. 
listening to unscriptural counsel on money management. So givers kind of, they're fascinated about the market, the stock market and all these things. And they can start listening to the wrong voices about giving. Uh, putting pressure on people who have less to give can be an immature use. And failing to discern God's promptings for a gift and not listening to the Holy Spirit. Judging those who misuse funds rather than advising them. Again, an immature use. You know, I, I, uh, one of the great uh, blessings that my church has is we have a, a giver, uh, and, and he's just an amazing, amazing man. And we have him teach classes to young, young couples about financial management. And it's such a benefit to them early in their married life to learn. So, you know, there, there are basically three main causes of friction in young marriages. You probably know this. Sex, in-laws, and money. Those are the th three main causes of problems in young marriages. But um, money is, is one of those problems sometimes. And, and, but learning how to come together in resource management is so important. Um, controlling people or ministries by gifts, this can be done. Corrupting people by giving too much, believe it or not, that can happen when some, you know, and giving needs to be giving. I mean, when you give to the church, you're not giving to the church, you're giving to the Lord, and you need to let go of it. You need to let go of it and trust the people that God has put in place to use the resources the right way. That's, then it's a gift. And then investing in projects that do not benefit the lives of people and the kingdom of God. So those are the characteristics and misuses of giving. I want to quickly move on to managing. I want to. There we go. Oops, now I went too far. What are the characteristics of the manager? The ability to see the overall picture and to clarify long-range goals. Managers, are, they're project-oriented, but big projects. Not just tasks, projects. They have a motivation to organize that for which they're responsible. They're orderly, they're systematic. They have a desire to complete tasks as quickly as possible. They're good stewards of people resources and material resources. They have an awareness of the resources available to complete a task. They're very savvy when it knows, how, you know, what's the order that things need to be done and what are the resources and they line them up ahead of time so that there's no delay. They have an ability to know what can and cannot be delegated. They like to delegate. They, they like to involve other people. They love to see other people using their gifts and investing in whatever the project is. And they have a, a keen sense of what, how to do that. And they have a tendency to let others lead until those in charge turn the responsibility over to them. That's why I'm not using the word leadership here. Because uh, people who are leaders it's, it's not a spiritual gift it, it in a sense it is because managers become leaders but um, they have to manage well you know the, in the leadership discussions and I've read I read a lot of stuff on leadership but I enjoy that too there's always a dis distinction between managers and leaders well if you're not a good manager or a good administrator you're not going to be a good leader now, you won't get stuck at that level of just management. You're going to be rising to a level of leadership as well. But you, you need to be able to do both. So, but managers don't necessarily jump to the front of the parade and say, I'm the leader. They're not always going to volunteer to be the leader. But once things are uh, evident that, that these leaders can do the best job, they will take the, the responsibility. They have a willingness to endure reaction from workers in order to accomplish the ultimate task. They're, they got thick skin, and they need to have it. Because when you're working with a lot of people, guess what? There are going to be a lot of complaints. You know? I mean, it just happens. You can't help it. Everybody has their own idea of how things should be done. And the manager needs to listen, but not be overly impacted by complaints and criticisms. They have a willingness to assume responsibility if no structured leadership exists. I kind of said that before. They have a sense of fulfillment and seeing all the pieces coming together and others enjoying the finished product. They, they love to see task completion. 
and they have a desire to move on to a new challenge when a task is fully completed. They're very challenge-oriented. They're visionary, and they love to see uh, vision completed and fulfilled. But there are some misuses to the gift of managing, viewing people as human resources rather than as human beings. <laughs> that can be a problem. People aren't just human resources, even though we have HR departments. They're human beings. Using people to accomplish personal ambitions, you know, so somebody's on the job and, and so uh, the, the manager's car needs to be washed. So here, go wash my car. That's a personal ambition that should not be given to somebody who's on the payroll of something else. Showing favoritism to those who appear to be more loyal. This is, this is a serious one. L loyalty is great. It's wonderful. But managers need to be careful. Some people just have a way of kind of wiggling their way into your heart because they're loyal. But you need to look for uh, character and competency and commitment. All three of those things, character and competency and commitment. And then taking charge of projects that are not God's direction. And, and especially when you're serving the church. Uh, need to be careful just because you're competent as a manager doesn't mean you should take on every project somebody suggests Okay Delegating too much work to others can be um, a sign of lack of maturity as manager Overlooking serious character flaws in valuable workers. This is a, a real tendency and I've seen this really hurt organizations when a manager bring somebody on who's very competent, but the character isn't there. I'll be, I have to say this, I've had to dismiss some people from the college, even within the last year, who had uh, some competency, but they didn't live by the values of the college. They didn't have the character. So this can happen. Um, being unresponsive to suggestions and appeals. You know, like I said, they need to listen. They don't necessarily have to agree with everybody, but they at least need to respond to suggestions and appeals. Failing to give proper explanation to workers. Sometimes they think they treat workers like, you know, mere hirelings rather than as brothers and sisters in Christ. A good manager helps people be excited about what they're doing because they show them the big picture. You know, no, you know, there's one illustration I remember. No, you're not just lay, laying bricks to build a wall. No, you're not just building a wall. You're helping Sir Christopher Wren build St. Paul's Cathedral. You see, show the big picture so that they know what it is. And then failing to give praise to workers. Managers are so sometimes so fast and so forward, they don't stop to thank and to praise people who have helped them uh, achieve their the goals. So those are the characteristics and misuses of managing. The empathizer. We'll just, this will be the last one, then we'll take a break, okay? So hang in there a few more minutes. <laughs> Sorry for those of you who are coffee addicts, uh, but we'll carry on for a few more minutes. So characteristics. Sensitivity to words and actions which hurt other people. Empathizers, this is a gift of mercy. They're very sensitive to other people's feelings. They have an ability to, descend, to, dis, to discern sincere motives in other people. Remember we talked about how prophets have some sort of an uh, antenna out about motivations and so on. Well, people of the gift of mercy also seem to have that same antenna to be able to discern motives, not perfectly, but better than most. An enjoyment and unity with those who are sensitive to the needs and feelings of others. They like other people who are uh, empathizers. I was teaching this material in a back church some time ago in New Jersey. And instead of doing it in a, you know, like, like a weekend series, like I like to do it, this church asked me to come for uh, seven Wednesday nights using their Bible teaching and prayer time. So I spread this out over seven times. And you know how when people come, I don't know if it happens here, but when people often come to church, they usually sit in the same place. Is that, is that how? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was happening sort of, although I saw movement going on from week to week, that was interesting. And so on, on the last night I did what I, I think we'll do uh, in the next session here, uh, some diagnostics. So how many of you think you're prophets? How many of you think you might have the gift of serving, etc.? And so 
Um, I didn't notice it until right at the end, but there were about uh, seven ladies who had, were all sitting together right to the front, right to the right of me. And as we go through the gifts, none of them were raising their hands. I thought, Why? what's wrong with it? Then when I said, how many have the gift of mercy? All of them raised their hand. They found each other and they really enjoy because they understand each other well and they have that same kind of sensitivity. Enjoyment and unity with those sensitive to the needs and feelings of others. And closing of his or her spirit to those who are insincere and insensitive. Close their spirit, but you'll never know it because they don't want you to feel bad. <laughs> but they will kind of be careful if they sense that somebody's uh, motives are insincere. Did I go through them all? I don't think I did. Oh, this one I didn't do. Ability to detect joy or distress in an individual or group. They have that sense of joy again. Under attraction to an understanding of people who are in distress. You know, most of us run from problems. They run to problems. They just want to wrap their arms around people, help them feel good. They want to remove hurts and bring healing to others now. Unlike the exhorter who's willing to let people suffer, recognizing how tribulation can bring about growth, this is not what the empathizer is. The empathizer just wants people to, to get better and to feel better now. And they and they're have a greater concern for mental distress than even physical distress. And then they avoid firmness unless they see how it will bring benefit. Again, different from the um, exhorter in that way. So what are the misuses of the gift of mercy? Failing to be firm and decisive when necessary. You know, this can be an, an issue between parents of kids because kids need discipline. Empathizers don't really like to do discipline stuff. Oh, and by the way, uh, studies have shown that 90% of the people with the gift of mercy or empathizing are married to prophets. Opposites attract, I guess. And 80% of people with the gift of serving are married to managers. Just kind of interesting the way that works. But failing to be firm and decisive when necessary. Taking up offenses for those who have been hurt. Taking up offense means if there, two people are in conflict, the empathizer will always come to the side of the weaker one or the one who's being hurt. Okay, is that noble or not? Well, sort of, except that it continues to disrupt the fellowship. Rather than seeking reconciliation between the two people, they're siding with one person and creating increased alienation. So that's, again, an immature use. Basing decisions on emotion rather than scripture or reason. Emotions are good, but they should never trump scripture or reason and allowing improper affection from those of the opposite sex. Now this is a, this is a, a red light warning here. Uh, pastors, especially with the gift of mercy, need to be very careful because they are so warm and embracing that people might feel they're coming on to me. And many pastors have, have crossed the line here and ruined their ministry because they haven't taken heed to this point of, uh, for example, never counsel a person of the opposite sex with the door closed or even alone if possible. I will never counsel a woman without my wife there. It's just a principle I'm, I'm living by. Never do it. In today's litigious society, it is so easy to be set up. And mercy isn't my gift, believe me. <laughs> my wife will tell you that. Uh, it's probably her gift though. Uh, but this is, this is something uh, that uh, an immature person in, with the gift of mercy needs to be really careful of. Come on. Cutting off fellowship from those who are less sensitive to others. Just, okay, you know, they sense somebody's not sensitive, so they, again, just cut off fellowship with them. Reacting to God's purposes of allowing people to suffer. Sometimes people with the gift of mercy get angry at God. They have to forgive God because God's allowing somebody to go through a problem. And if I were God, I would never let that happen. Well, thank God you're not God, right? Or nobody would ever grow. But really, sometimes they react to God's purposes in allowing people to suffer. Some, symp sympathizing with those who are violating God's standards. Somehow 
being overly tolerant about sin because you don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But they're living in sin. And you're not seeing how that really is hurting them. But an immature person of mercy may not, uh, may, may violate God's standards. And then establishing possessive friendships with others, the codependency thing, the, the, where uh, the person uh, who is in distress, in emotional distress, becomes overly needy on, on the person with mercy and over dependent, and that can be a sad thing as well. So those are the, 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 um, rest of the gifts that we went through. So yesterday, uh, I did a little diagnostic, and I asked how many of you believe you know that your gift is either the first, th one of the first three, prophecy, serving, or teaching. If you, and although we didn't go over it again carefully, let me just ask you, if you raise your hand yesterday and you're still thinking it is one of those, or you think it is now, raise your hand if you think it's one of those three. Remember, don't, don't think you're being prideful. A gift is not something that you earned. It's something that's given to you. So, okay, it's a very small number. I thought there were more yesterday. Okay, don't hesitate. This is a gift to the body of Christ. Okay, so, thank you. Prophecy or serving or teaching. And you're thinking it's one of those three. Okay, now keep your hand up if you think it's prophecy. Put it down if you don't. Okay, there won't be many. Okay, serving. Okay, more of them, and that's a good thing because the church needs a lot of service. And teaching, how many think your, your, your gift is teaching? Okay, quite a few, pastors especially. Okay, good. Okay, so now, uh, if you think it's one of the last four, exhorting, or oh, already, <laughs> exhorting, or giving, or managing, or mercy. Let's go through them one at a time. Exhorting. You're pretty sure your gift is exhorting. Mm -hmm. Amen. I see that. <laughs> How many think you, you're not allowed to look at this one? <laughs> How many of you think your gift is giving? Okay. Just <laughs> they got it on film anyhow. Uh, so very good. Excellent. Praise God. So how many of you think your gift is managing? Okay. All right. Good. Got a couple here good managers. And how many think your gift is mercy or, or empathizing? All right, good, good. That's a good balance. There's a really good balance. That's wonderful. So how many of you, uh, okay, I'll let you go, but how many of you are conflicted between two gifts? You're kind of debating between two, because I saw some of you raise your hands twice. Okay, so a number of you are, and we'll, we'll drill into helping figure that out. Okay, so I think we'll take a break right now. And uh, be back in about 10 minutes, okay? Pardon? What, questions? You have the question? Or somebody has a question? Is it, are there anybody with a question right now? Well, so it's possible for you to have more than one gift. No. <laughs> maybe one major. One. <laughs> okay, maybe. It's, it's, is it possible for you to have more than, than one DNA? No. It's how you're wired. But yes, there are there's going to be one that's probably close. I was thinking my gift was managing for a long time. Like my dad's, thought, my mom thought my dad's gift was managing. It's not my gift. You know why? I don't get joy out of that. I hate email. You know, I, I hate strategic planning. I hate a lot of the stuff that goes along with managing, but I have to do a lot of it. But I love this. Because I love teaching because that's my gift. I love to, when you're in your gifting, you know it because you have joy when you're using it. You could be a teacher and so have the gift of giving and, 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 and take some joy in giving yes. and still take some joy in giving. Yes, you, you, you will have joy in both of them. God loves a cheerful giver and, you know, but he'll take money from a grouch too. I want to say that so quickly. But, but you're right, um, you can get joy in ministries, but one of those, you are really absolutely, it's in your soul, it's in your heart, it's what you are, are, are born to do. You feel the greatest sense of fulfillment. You know, and I think I went through yesterday about three or four slides that show in the Bible very clearly, never anywhere does it say a believer has more than one spiritual gift. 
I, I went through, I think, about six or eight points. Paul says it. Peter says it over and over again. The, the illustration of the members of the body. You're not an eye and a nose. You're one. But a gift is not an activity or an ability. It's your motivation. It's your deep drive to serve the body of Christ. You know, we were coming, I was coming yesterday. Um, I met Kinsley who drove us. And on the way back, I, I said, what is, your, what is your gift? He said, serving. He knew it right away because he has tremendous joy out of that. And when you're doing it, you, you're, you're, you become aware of it more and more. Okay. In your opinion, yeah. if you take somebody like Apostle Paul in the mm -hmm. Bible, mm -hmm. what gift do you, do you think he had? I believe the Apostle Paul was an exhorter. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go through some some of that in, in the next session. Uh, I really believe, you know, he shows all the marks of being an exhorter. And uh, so we'll go through and I'll explain why and use other illustrations, Bible illustrations in the next session. That's my opinion. You're right. You used the right word. In my opinion, he didn't walk around with a tag saying, "I'm an exhorter," you know. <laughs> but he, I, I think that was, and I'll try to explain why. Another question. So, um, is it a case where, you, because I think that sometimes when you become a leader, you exhibit several of the giftings, but maybe you have a predominant one, and then others. Might, uh, I'm torn in between using manifest out of it but you exhibit the qualities in other yeah. gifts as yeah. well that's true you can exhibit qualities in the others but one of them is definitely how you're most you're hardwired i mean I, and sometimes it's because you have to do these other things you know like i have to do some quite a bit of management you know but it's not it's not my gift and you know and um i know prince here he, he has to do a lot of pastoring but his gift is profit. And, and so I know when he's functioning in his primary gift, there's tremendous joy and energy. Like, I mean, if you were here last night, you know, you could have taken the energy that he illustrated last night and run a whole city <laughs> electronically from that energy, okay? But he wasn't tired. He was not tired. And that's another tip off. When you're using your gift, you, you don't get exhausted. Whereas when you're outside your gift, you do get exhausted. And so you look for joy, you look for, you know, your endurance, and, and you look also for what other people say. And I'll tell you another thing I look for. The people with the most questions usually are, have the gift of teaching. <laughs> and that's good. Uh, uh, um, okay, let me use this. Okay. Um, is it possible to see, or is it right to see, in your opinion, um, can we associate giftings to certain callings or ministries? I, I think if you talk about callings, especially first of all, I think a, a calling is a function in the church. Yes. And the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastors, teachers, yeah. overseers, elders, etc. these callings, they can be of any gift. There's not a necessary correlation between a gift and a calling. But certainly, if you have a teacher, he has teaching as a gift. Yeah. Um, you get me? Because there's again, not all people who do teaching have the gift of teaching. So let me give you one quick clarification idea on that. A lot of people like to teach, but they don't like to do research. They don't like to spend hours digging and digging and digging in research, learning the languages. That's what a teacher does. It's, you, you know, I would much rather, I mean, I love being with you, but if I had the chance, I'd rather be back in the air conditioned hotel using my blue letter Bible to learn more about Hebrew and Greek words, because that's just, I, I want to learn. I, I want to research. So, that's basically how a teacher is wired and different from some of the other, other gifts. But, but you're right, it, a teacher is also a function. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, 
But as I said yesterday, I think some of the best teachers in terms of the activity of teaching are people with the gift of mercy because they're student oriented. Whereas many of us are text oriented or subject oriented or doctrine oriented. But, but people with mercy, they're very focused on the student and, and therefore they're good teachers. I don't know if you, you I, learned, I learned the most in school not from people who had the most knowledge, but from the teachers who cared about me. Teachers who cared about me, I could tell it. So anyhow, maybe that's helpful. I'm sure that but the Holy Spirit was clearly on people and anointing people for different ministries. And so while this is somewhat speculative, and I will not argue if you say, no, so-and-so was not this, he was that, or she was that, I'm gonna say, okay, fine. <laughs> Uh, but this is how I see it, and, and it'll help you a little bit, maybe, if you really are clued into these people. So what are some, um, come on here, maybe I'm not supposed to do this. I think the battery might be a little bit on the weak side of this, I'm just not getting it. There we go, I've got it. It might be okay. It might be okay. Okay, thank you. So what are some possible biblical examples? Possible, okay? Thinking of those character qualities, especially, that we look through. And I don't know if you have them there in your notes, but I would say that Moses was a prophet. Prophet of God. I mean, he, had a, he, he heard from God, he met with God, and he had incredible courage and, and thank you, and, you know, spoke powerfully against the power, not just against, you have to understand, Pharaoh was a god. He was considered to be a god by the people. So when Moses went and confronted him, he wasn't just confronting, at least as it seemed to be, another human. So he had incredible courage. Uh, I think John the Baptist was a prophet. I mean, clearly, I mean, he, he was the prophet that was predicted who would be the forerunner to Christ. You know, and he, his first words coming out the chute was repent, <laughs> repent. And, and he had a very uh, direct way of speaking and, and, you know, he confronted Herod the way he did. And, and even though he lost his life for it, um, he wasn't going to back down. And then I think Peter, uh, Peter's an enigma because, you know, he st stumbled so often, but I admire Peter so much. I identify with him too. Uh, you know, yes, he did he did deny Jesus three times, but he did all kinds of things that hardly anybody else was going to do. And Jesus entrusted him to be the leader. And I love this, when at the, the Last Supper, and Jesus, he, Jesus saying he was gonna die and, and, and that you will all leave me. And Peter said, not me, uh-uh, I'm gonna be with you, I'll even die with you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the night's over, you'll deny me three times. And then he said this, you know, and here's where there's an unfortunate chapter division in John. At the end of chapter 13, he says, he says but after you have returned, <laughs> Jesus is already predicting that he's going to be restored. After you have returned, strengthen your brothers. And then he goes on, for, but let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. So when you're going through that text, just forget the chapter division there because those are arbitrary. They weren't inspired. But I think Peter was, um, was a prophet. Um, so, um, whoops, went the wrong way. Come on. Here we go. Got it again. I think, um, Joshua, I think was a servant. He served Moses. He was a servant of the Lord. Moses had to keep encouraging him, giving him, building him up, be, be courageous, be, you know, and, and so he was definitely task oriented. The task being to go and one people group at a time, one territory at a time, lead the children of Israel under the power of God to destroy th these uh, Canaanite rel religious groups um, because of their worship of false gods. I believe Martha was a server, and uh, although she sometimes is criticized because, you know, she, you know, when G Mary was at the feet of Jesus, Martha was complaining. Jesus wasn't complaining about her serving. He was complaining about the fact that she was criticizing her sister. Okay, so 
but I think Martha was a server, and I think also uh, Timothy was a server. Uh, he certainly was, a, he, he, Timothy was to Paul like Joshua was to Moses. He served him, he stayed with him, he, right up to the very end, I think Timothy was probably a server. Teachers, okay, this one might be a little bit of a stretch. Solomon is probably the hardest person in the Bible to figure out. He's the wisest man in the world, and yet he married 700 wives and had 300 concubines. So how in the world does that fit? Well, these were mostly political allegiances, you know. But um, his fascination with words, the Proverbs are incredible. I mean, they're not just wise, they're constructed so beautifully. Ecclesiastes is just deep thinking. He's a critical thinker. Uh, he shows all of the aspects of, of being a teacher. And then I think Luke was a teacher. Um, the Gospel of Luke is arranged very systematically. And if you read the first couple verses of Luke, he said, I want you to know, Theophilus, that I'm bringing to you information that I carefully researched. And I went to eyewitnesses, and I'm presenting to you an orderly account. All of those things smack of being a teacher. Research, finding eyewitnesses, and especially an orderly account. If you understand, you know, so some of you have seen um, my book, Follow Me, where I go through Luke's gospel and show the, 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 the curriculum Jesus actually used in making the disciples. He didn't just willy-nilly say, okay, guys, let's today talk about, what should we talk about? Anybody want to? No, he had a plan, Jesus did. And, he, and, and Luke brings it out. He shows in three stages how Jesus taught the disciples about learning kingdom values, learning kingdom ministry, and then learning kingdom leadership. He had an outline, he had a plan, and, that, and he d demonstrates what Jesus did that way. So I think Luke was a, a teacher, and I think Apollos. We don't know a lot about him, but if you read the description of him at the end of, of Acts 18, the beginning of Acts 19, he was a man thoroughly, he, he understood the scriptures. He was powerful in teaching about Jesus, the Messiah, refuting the Judaizers and others. And, um, and I, I think, now, okay, here I'm really going to go out on a limb, and I will not argue anybody, but I think we don't know who the author of Hebrews was. Um, the King James puts in that it was Paul, but that's not in the Greek at all. And, it, and it's certainly not the vocabulary of Paul. I think it could have been Apollos, just the careful reasoning, the understanding of, of Judaism the way Apollos did, maybe. But I think Apollos was a teacher. Exhorters, I think Samuel was an exhorter. He was an encourager. God used him to encourage the nation. They came around him. He was able to inspire leaders and, and, and anoint leaders. And, and, and he was an overseer in a way. I, I, think, I think Samuel was, was an encourager. I think Isaiah was as well. If you read the, the prophecies of Isaiah, I mean, look at his ministry to Hezekiah. He was constantly encouraging him and, and building him up and, and, and helping the nation come through a really stressful time by being an encouraging leader. And, and uh, you know, I, I will any day follow a spirit-filled encourager as a leader because they are visionary in their focus on the future and they see how to solve problems. I think, I think Paul was an encourager, an exhorter. Now you could say, oh, he was a teacher. He was, yes, he did some great writing and teaching. But if you read the letters, Paul uses doctrine to get at practical teaching about how to live. Just read your, almost any of his epistles. Start out teaching doctrine but so that he can get to the point of saying, and therefore, based on these truths, you should no longer live like pagans. You should do this. You should be honest. You should. I mean, he, it's all exhortation, a lot of exhortation that you see in the Apostle Paul. Now, he, he obviously was multi-talented and, and used by God in, in powerful ways, but my, my suggestion is he was an exhorter. Uh, givers. So Joseph of the Old Testament, some might say, well, he was a manager, and okay, I wouldn't argue you too much on that. But I think Joseph's primary drive was the idea of managing resources. Of, you know, so the Pharaoh trusted Joseph because Joseph, not only did he 
see the big picture of what was going to happen through the visions that God had given him. But Joseph was able, being appointed by the Pharaoh to be in charge of all the resources, to take the people through uh, the time of famine because he had made sure that there would be resources stored up during the seven years of plenty. And so he was very resource-oriented, very um, uh, gifted at somebody who, who could in, you know, help the people invest in their future, even though they didn't know what their future would be, but he did. I think Andrew is an illustration of a giver. We don't know a lot about Andrew, but what we do know is every time you find Andrew, he's bringing somebody to Jesus and they're bringing some kind of a, a, a gift or some, some, something in, that's going to uh, increase the capacity of the disciples uh, to, to serve God. So Andrew may well have been a giver. And then um, Barnabas. Barnabas, you, you know, although he's the son of encouragement and, and, and consolation, you could say he's an encourager, maybe so. But I'm kind of leaning on the, the giving side. The story of Barnabas, you know, in, in Acts chapter, I think it's six, where after Pentecost, you know, the people from all of these different groups who gathered for Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came down and they stayed there. Now, all of a sudden, the population of Jerusalem has swelled about five, five-fold and these people are staying together, well, they got to be fed. Barnabas sold all of his property and gave it to the apostles for them to feed the people. Just an incredible spirit of generosity and, and giving there. And then managers. Well, Noah. I mean, who else? What else? <laughs> now, of course, the Holy Spirit hadn't come, but in terms of a, a major project management job, I mean, building the ark, he didn't have blueprints other than what God had told him to do. And then getting the animals there two by two, obviously there was some miraculous stuff involved there, I'm sure. But, um, but I would say, you know, maybe in a somewhat humorous way, Noah just really managed things well. Uh, and God used him to, to uh, preserve human life and animal life. Deborah. Deborah. Uh, one of the judges uh, was, seemed to have been a manager. She, she was not looking to be the leader, but when she was called upon, she took a leadership responsibility and then she delegated responsibility. So I would see Deborah as, as a leader as well. And then Nehemiah, classic here, I think. I mean, when you read how God used Nehemiah to appeal to, to um, uh, which one was it? Yeah, the Persian emperor, <laughs> Cyrus. Was it Cyrus or Darius? It was one of those two, Cyrus or Darius. He appealed uh, about the city. Was, the walls were broken down, and, and he was heartbroken. And so the, uh, the Persian emperor said, okay, you go back, rebuild it, and take these resources. And he brought all these resources together. And then when you read the story about how they rebuilt the walls, and he, he delegated this group, you'd take care of that part of the wall. This group, you'd take care of that part and make sure you, that you have your trowel in one hand and the sword in the other because the enemies are going to try to stop us. And Nehemiah was an amazing manager, amazing manager. And then in terms of mercy, I see, uh, I think David was a man of mercy. Uh, when you read particularly the Psalms of David, and let, let me caution you, uh, we say that David was the author of the Psalms. David, according to the headings of the Psalms, he was the author of about 72 of the 150. We don't know. Some of you have others, the, others, the sons of Korah and so on, who are other authors. Uh, there's a Psalm of Moses. There's some Psalms of Solomon um, and, and, and others. But looking at the Psalms of David, David's favorite word is chesed. His mercy endureth forever. His loving kindness endures forever. And, and David had a soft heart. He was a warrior, no question about that. He was a warrior, but he, all of his warfare was because of his zeal for God. But he, he had a, a he, you know, the, the one reason I think he still, he was called uh, the man after God's own heart when, you know, he messed up in his life, no question about that. But he continued to be called the man after God's own heart because almost all the other kings flirted with other gods. 
the other gods. That, that's why Solomon got messed up because he married wives who brought their gods with them. And, and they're only, so in, in the, I think, 22 kings of Israel, the northern tribes, none of them were considered righteous. They were all evil. And of the similar number, I think 19 or 20, of the kings of Judah, I think there are only four that were considered righteous. David predated that, of course, because it was the United Kingdom. But it was be he was a man for God's own heart because he stayed steadfast in believing in only one and committed to only one God, Jehovah. Jehovah, our Elohim. Not one of the Elohims of the other nations. And if that boggles your mind, just read Psalm 82, for example, or 138, for example, where it talks about the gods of the nations. But David's his heart was steadfast on Jehovah. Jehovah, by the way, is the only name for God. The others are all titles. He is an Elohim. He is an Adonai, which means a master. He's an El Shaddai. He's, he's you know, uh, Lord Sabaoth. These are titles. But he said, my name, my memorial name is Yahweh. I will be who I will be. And that's, that's his name. Okay, so... That was David. I think Mary, probably the sister of Martha, was an empathizer. Just the, the beautiful story about, she has such a tender spirit and heart. And, and, you know, sitting at the feet of Jesus, but how her heart was. And so was Martha's, broken about, about Lazarus' death and so on. But I would say Mary was, was an empathizer. And finally, I think John, the Apostle John. Yes, he was one of the sons of thunder. But, if you, <laughs> but I think James was, had a lot more thunder than John. Uh, John was the one that was closest to Jesus. John was the one that Jesus entrusted his mother to. And I think John probably demonstrated, if you, if you read the, the epistles of John, he's constantly talking about fellowship, fellowship. We want, we want, we want to be together. We, we want to, you know, be in fellowship with each other. And so I, possibly John was an empathizer. So you may differ with some of these, and that's fine, or think of other better illustrations. Uh, I'm sure you can, uh, but these are ones I jotted down just to give you an idea how, how some of these character qualities can kind of better identify or define a person. Anybody want to make a comment on, on any of that? Yes? Oh, okay. Um, well, in my opinion, in my opinion, I think that uh, uh, Joseph was a manager. Joseph. Who? Joseph. Joseph, yeah. In my opinion, yeah. was a manager. Manager. I won't argue you on that one. And uh, <laughs> Samuel and Isaiah were prophets, in my opinion. Isaiah was a... Isaiah and Samuel. Somewhere, and could, Isaiah, be. could be. In my opinion, they yeah. were, they're, 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 they're prophets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he certainly had the the ministry of being a pro prophet and right. prophesying, no doubt. Right. And it may have been a spiritual gift. But again, we're using spiritual gift here a little bit loosely because these were all Old Testament people before the Holy Spirit had come right. resident. But they're just illustrations. But perfectly possible. Another comment. I just will comment on, on David. I also see him as a manager. Um, I'm always intrigued by the way he was able to gather people who were distressed, who were in debt, and who were disgruntled. He managed to put them together and, and, and had a very um, um, great and loyal team. Yeah, you know. Yeah, very good. So David, maybe as a manager, uh, certainly the greatest king. Um, so I wouldn't argue on that either. I just kind of focusing on, you know, what I hear him saying in his writings. But clearly his life was one of great leadership and management. No question about that. So again, this is just to sort of illustrate. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just for a little clarification, there must be a reason why Reverend Ima thinks that these ones must be prophets. If he could make the point, then probably we would also understand why you 
put them under this, then probably we get a better understanding, even for ourselves, to yeah. uh, where we think we are conflicted, we can yeah. position ourselves. Well. Yeah. And somebody made I the point that, earlier that... I think that I was just making a point based on what Reverend Mas said earlier in the day, mm -hmm. that you could have some gifts which are dominant, mm -hmm. but there could be other uh, gifts too. Mm -hmm. you know. well, I think we default, though, to one. But yes, there's no question. We function in all of In fact, there was one slide we used yesterday that said we have to be involved in all of these things as activities, but one is going to be your primary, primary gift. Another comment? In my, in my opinion, I think that uh, this one gift um, teaching, you should rather coin a term and use a major gift and a minor gift. I, I would love to do that. Help. I would because love to do that, but the Bible you know, doesn't we, do that. I'm, I'm an under, because if you look at the uh -huh. examples that we have given, it's like people are playing double role, have double gifts, even with the names that we have given. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying that we should rather use major gifts and minor gifts. Okay. I hear you, but what you're doing there is theologizing, because that's, I don't have any way of substantiating that idea biblically. It's a good idea. And I can see it at work in people's lives. But, I, you know, the Bible is totally clear that you have one, one spiritual gift. Yeah. That's totally true. That's not an opinion. That's what the Bible says. Well, um, can we look at it from this point? That, um, you know, talents are natural gifts. Yeah. Giftings that we're talking about are more of a spiritual uh, gift, as it were. So, if we look at talent, I think all truth is fair. If you look at talent, you can get somebody who has a, no, more than one talent. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No yeah. question. More than one talent. Yeah. But a spiritual gift is not a talent, it's not an activity, it's not something you do. It's how you're motivated, and it's and what you do comes out of how you're motivated. So that's a major part of understanding what a charisma is. It's a grace thing. It's not what you do. It's by grace <laughs> you're saved, not of your works. So let, let me move on because there are several others, and I don't want to. We're already probably a little bit past time. I want to finish up with a couple other things here that might be important for you. My battery's running low. It says here. Uh oh. I don't know if I'll be able to do this or not. It says the battery's running low. So let me tell you one of the things that we're not going to be able to get into, but I'm willing to stay if anybody needs to and wants to. If you're undecided between two gifts, and there are certain ones that are sometimes a little entangled, serving and mercy, we talked about that with a couple people, uh, they can be uh, in, uh, a little bit confusing, or some of the others. Um, I have diagnostic questions on about 20 different slides, and I'm not going to go through them, but if you're saying, yeah, I'm confused between whatever, managing and giving or something like that, I'll ask you some questions that would help you uh, hopefully uh, decipher between the two. Um, so I want to I want to do this quickly, and I have slides for this, but I don't need to use the slides. I can just mention it. Um, huh. Boy, there are several slides I'd love to give you. We have a whole section on how, you, how I can use my, my gift, and one of them is to uh, looks at how sometimes we're, we're prone to misunderstand other people because we don't see things the way they do. We're not motivated the way they are. And so we might find ourselves judging other people. And of course, we're not supposed to do that, but it's pretty hard not to sometimes when we have so many differences. But how do you use your spiritual gift? You use it through ministries. And the idea is to choose the ministries that will best uh, 
Look there. Can I still do this? Okay, so, um, so we're not going to go through all the, that's the wrong way. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so we're not going to be able to look at <laughs> the slides. <laughs> um, okay. So this is an, another way of looking at it. What we need in our church, okay, is, and you can see, strong sermons exposing sin, proclaiming righteousness, calling people to repentance. That would be the prophet. We need practical ministries of service to show the love of Christ in our church and to help our church members and neighbors with their needs. Yes, the server would care a lot about that. We all should care about these things, but some people, this is more their core. We need in-depth Bible studies and messages with special emphasis on an accurate interpretation, explanation of words, and insights from biblical examples. That's the teacher's concern. We need personal discipleship, encouragement, and counseling for each member with an emphasis on principles for growth, backed by a strong ministry of prayer. That's the focus of the exhorter. We need emphasis on stewardship of money, time, talents, and relationships, generous support of missionaries and other Christian workers. That would be the giver's greatest concern. We need smooth running operations in all areas of the church life, utilizing the gifts and skills of everyone so that everything is done decently and in order. That would be the manager's focus. And then what we need in our church are compassionate and loving listeners to comfort our hurting members and others in our community. That's the empathizer. What we need in our church are all those things. And that's why God has given to the church people with these seven different motivational gifts. So there are so many other things that we could look at, uh, but I want to point to uh, one other idea here. In terms of ministry to the body of Christ, whatever God calls you to do, and you are able to choose ministries, here are a couple points of guidance here. Ministry to the body by fulfilling your responsibility. If you're a member of the body of Christ, you're called to be a minister, not a spectator. Please understand that. If you're just a spectator, you're just taking up space, and God didn't gift you for just to take up space. Find out a ministry that is complementary to your spiritual gift, but also to determine priorities, knowing when to say yes. In particular, I'm talking to servers, and there were quite a few of you who said, I'm a server. Knowing when to say yes and when to say no. Servers have a hard time saying no, and they get overcommitted and, and either slow things down or get exhausted or don't do things in an in a, uh, excellent way. So learning when to say yes and when to say no. And then edifying the body of Christ, building it up. Yes, the exhorter, that's their primary focus, is to build up the body of Christ. But for all of us, we're, we're called to, to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all become mature. That's what Ephesians 4 talks about. So that's how we can use our gift. So um, I, I don't think I can go into the section on, on anticipating responses, um, but uh, there is there's a good bit more teaching here, and there is teaching on, um, I've got three slides that talk about 15 abuses, not just of spiritual gifts, but of the manifestations and the ministries, 15 abuses of the pneumatica that uh, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. 15 abuses. And you see these things happening frequently because people don't pay attention to what the Word of God says. And God will never bless, He will never bless when there's either disobedience to His Word or ignorance of His Word. So you might want to yourself kind of see if you can find what those things are we don't have time to go through that now. And the last thing I have that we don't have time for, <laughs> I'm afraid, is, uh, again, uh, slides that show uh, comparisons. That if, you know, you're debating between two gifts, there are some diagnostic questions that will say, you know, and they all focus really on motivation. You know, for example, the serving and, and, and um, empathy one that... I talked about with several people during the break. You know, they're both wanting to, servers and empathizers both want to meet needs.
but there's a difference. The server wants to meet practical needs. They like projects. They like to work with their hands. They like to get pr practical things done quickly. The empathizer likes to meet personal needs, emotional needs. They're people-oriented, not project-oriented. And I use as an illustration, um, when a person is in trauma, suffering emotional problems, crying, weeping, needy, desperate, do you run to the person or from the person? If you run to the person, you probably have the gift of mercy. Because people with the gift of mercy, they're not as concerned about themselves. They're not intimidated by the problems. They don't feel that they have to be the solution. They just want to show love and care. It's a powerful gift. People with the gift of serving, while they will care about the person, and they may see the need to go help and comfort, they won't run to it. <laughs> They'll be a little intimidated by it and would much rather, you know, sweep the church floor or, or clean off the bulletin board or something that's more project oriented. So there are ways of distinguishing between, and we can do that with, you know, between prophet and server, prophet and teacher, prophet and exhorter, prophet and all the way down, then server and exhorter and server and teacher and server. And so I've got questions that kind of speak to the differences of all of those possibilities when there's any confusion. I, we don't have time for this, but I'm just going to ask um, without going. Pardon? Can we do that? The 15 abuses? Is that what you're wanting to do? Yeah, I'm asking if you can do that. I could. You want me to? I think so. You're the bishop. I will gladly do it. <laughs> okay, so uh, I will do that. Um, let me find it. It's down here a ways. This is stuff I wish I had to, oh, I wish I had time to go over this. So uh, we'd be talking about four ways and that each of the gifts are involved in, in ministry in the church. Um, you want to do that? Okay. Hang on here. The, the, the okay, I hope this is practical. Uh, um, so, the prophet, God will use you to guard the reputation of the church by your keen sensitivity to righteousness. But you got to speak up, and prophets will speak. That's a, one of the speaking gifts. You will frequently manifest. So here's on the second bar in each of these. I'm going to show how each spiritual gift can connect with manifestations. Not necessarily, but here are some likely correlations. So the prophet will frequently manifest words of knowledge and discernment of spirits. Frequently. Others as well. Not limiting. Okay. Um, you will not accept compromise and you will call people to decision. Remember, black and white, they see things. And they, call, they want response. They want people to respond to, to messages and so on. And then this last bar in each one is a reflection of the verses in Romans 12 that follow Romans 6 through 8, the listing of the seven. So for the prophet, you will be effective as you speak in love. Prophets need to be able to couch their message in love. Uh, otherwise, people will reject it. I don't know if that's practical, but I'm hoping it's a speaking gift, okay? So prophets are going to be speakers, okay? So... Uh, oh, so I don't get it. Okay, so the, the main one isn't switching here. Uh, the ministering server. Do I need to do something else? Okay, all right. So the ministering server. You will be foundational to the effective functioning of the church. If you're a server, you, you want to work. You want to serve. Volunteer. Don't wait for somebody to come and say, would you do this or that? Volunteers, you know, to one of the pastors or leaders, you know, I'm, I'm a server. I'd love to help in the church. What can I do? You will frequently manifest helps, hospitality, and miracles. Why miracles? 
Well, God can do a miracle through any spirit-filled Christian. I would, I've seen God do miracles rarely through me. It's not my gift. Why servers? And, and I'll say the same thing later about people with gift of mercy. They're probably the least egotistical. They're the least likely to take credit. They're the most likely to make sure that God gets the glory for everything. And that's just a supposition, but I think it's a possibility. You will frequently manifest helps and hospitality and miracles. You'll demonstrate the character of Christ by honoring others above yourself. Again, they're selfless people, generally servers. And then the admonition from Romans 12, do not become weary in well-doing <laughs> because they do a lot and they can become weary. The ministering, um, oops, I'm going the wrong way again. The ministering teacher, you will guide many in the church into enthusiasm for scripture and the correct interpretation and understanding of scripture. You'll be a little bit of a guardian for the truth to make sure, but you need to do it gently. You, words of wisdom and words of knowledge will be manifest in you because teachers are focused on words. Words are important. We talked about that yesterday. So uh, you will prevent many from erroneous use of God's word and much spiritual harm because teachers really are focused on the truth, the foundational truth of scripture. They won't allow the church to get off, off center. Uh, it's happening in, in some countries in East Africa right now that I'm going to be going to where churches are being shut down because so-called pastors are exploiting the church with heresies that uh, um, the government is shutting down some of these churches actually. And the admonition is be fervent in spirit as well as intellect. So teachers need to make sure that you have a rich devotional life. And it's not always easy because if you're a teacher, you're always thinking about how to use this material to apply to somebody else. How can I build a lesson out of this? Maybe God wants to teach you, teach me. So uh, fervent in spirit as well as intellect. The ministering um, exhorter. Uh, you will be the Holy Spirit's chief helper in counseling and encouraging people. If you're an exhorter, um, you, you, you need, people need to, that's why we need to know each other's gifts. The pastors can't do everything. They need to know who's out there, who's a mature believer, whom I can send people for counseling to as an exhorter. Your primary manifestations may be faith because your, your belief in the future of somebody's life, faith that God can take this person who's living maybe right now in, in mediocrity or even carnality and make this person become a, a worshiping warrior. Faith and gifts of healing, gifts of healing. Exhorters, you know, are focused on the whole person. Yes, their mind, their emotions, their body. And God may use the exhorter to bring people into healing. And then um, your hope and trust in God will inspire many to believe in and take steps toward their own growth. Again, they're very positive. They're optimistic. They, 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 have, they believe in your future. And they'll help you become a believer in your future if you don't yourself. And the admonition is to be patient and persistent in prayer. That admonition, especially to the exhorters. I mean, we're all to be prayer warriors. But because the exhorter is helping people move on in their life and spiritual growth, only God can do that. And the exhorter can give good counsel, but in terms of depending on God, it comes from a life of prayer. The ministering giver your zeal for the prosperity of the work of the Lord will be a blessing to many. Givers who do have a lot of resources take great joy in giving. They really do. But as we said earlier, they don't want to be pressured into it. But they'll be a blessing to the church. They will manifest faith. Again, the idea of investing and having faith in what God will do through the resources. And the discernment of spirits. We talked about that a little bit. We were talking about the giver, that they're able to sense sincerity and when they're being scammed a bit. And so they will have that discernment. And their sense of stewardship and investment will guide the church. I'm so convinced that every church should have a person with the gift of giving on their board and listen to them because they're going to be concerned about good stewardship. And stewardship is a very, very major um, topic that Jesus taught about. 
He talked about stewardship more than he talked about heaven. So stewardship is important. And you will be cheerful in giving and in hospitality, according to the admonition in Romans. What about the uh, manager? You will help set the agenda and lead the people into the church's future. The, the manager sees down the road. The manager is visionary. The manager wants to uh, help the church move into a better future, strengthen the, strengthen the, the body um, materially and, and people resources and, and, and program resources. You will manifest prophetic insight into God's plans so you can align with them and be given words of wisdom for leading. Um, managers, again, will, uh, prophecy is also, beside being a spiritual gift, it is a manifestation. And when, through the Holy Spirit's teaching or some other teaching, the, the manager receives, they're being able to get a hold of that vision that will give guidance to the church's future. Words of wisdom for leading because they're gonna be delegating and they need to be able to be careful as to how they do that and not being an overlord. You will not be sidetracked by trends or tempted by shortcuts. There's no easy, easy fix to a lot of things and the, the server or the manager wants to do things with excellence and not shortcuts. And then the admonition in Romans 12, 14, God's people will expect a lot from you. When you're in a leadership role, a management role, there's a high, heavy expectation upon you. And um, so that's the admonition there. They may criticize you even, but again, if you're living in the life of the Holy Spirit, uh, you will gently respond to your critics. And then the last one is the ministering empathizer. You will know God's heart and be his arms and tears for many. Uh, it's a powerful ministry, it really is. People will confide in you that they will not confide in other people because they trust you. Manifestations of faith and gifts of healing will work through you. Again, people of this gift are the least likely to be um, self-absorbed and, and egoistic about how, about how they serve. That's not to say that others are, but I think some of these gifts are, are more naturally uh, selfless. And then the admonition is Romans 12, 15, your pastoral heart may be vulnerable to wounding. I think that verse says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice because you'll be on that emotional level. So I hope, I hope those are, give some directions toward practical ways that different people with these different gifts can be used in the church. But again, let me just encourage you. So many of your pastors, <clears throat> encourage your people. I was gonna say to volunteer, but you know what? <laughs> in the work of the Lord, there really are no volunteers. You're either called or you're not. You don't really, really want volunteers because they feel that they don't have to do it because they're just volunteers. So when you're encouraging a person to take on a ministry, the main thing to do is say, please come before the Lord to see if he's calling you into this ministry. Because then they'll be faithful because they know they're working for the Lord. If they're just a volunteer, they're not gonna be faithful. And how many times I've had it in my own churches where somebody gets elected to a position and they like the title, but they don't, they don't do the job. They don't show up for meetings, they're not available, they're too busy, they got other stuff going on, but they like the title. Uh-uh, they shouldn't be in that role. Even if, they ha even if they could do it, but they're not available. All right, so um, I'm gonna um, rifle really quickly. Uh, okay, so these are manifestations. Okay, here we are. Uh, these are the 15, I got five on each slide. And you can uh, write down these references if you want. It might be a little hard for you to read. C can we get them up? Here we go. Sensitivity to abuse. Abuse of, the ma of mostly manifestations, but some of them are abuses to the pneumatica in general. I'm abusing them when I do not honor the entire Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is one, and we don't honor one part of the Godhead. You can find that in verses four to six. I, when I deny the Spirit's sovereignty in distributing manifestations as he chooses, it's the Holy Spirit's job to give manifestations. 
It's not something that you opt for and, or somebody tries to force you into. If it doesn't come from the Holy Spirit, it's not a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And I, this, one's abu this one's abused a lot. When I act or minister independently of the rest of the body, verses 14 to 18 of chapter 12. When I'm not in line and in sync with the rest of the body, coordinated, when I'm an independent agent, when I show more honor to the more external, obvious manifestations, then I'm abusing them. Paul talks about that in terms of the, the members, the parts of the body. Some of the parts of the body that aren't as public are more important even than the parts of the body that are public. You know what I mean. That's what Paul is saying there in verses 22 to 25. And then when I expect all members to exhibit any one or all of the manifestations, you know, and this again sometimes, you know, is, is violated, you know, and I have been a part of groups that, that, in fact, I have very dear friends who believe that, you know, unless you speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, go through the book of Acts. You'll find that happens three times, but you'll find the, the uh, phrases that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit when they, and there are about eight or nine other manifestations besides speaking in tongues. This is not to say speaking in tongues is invalid, but the one that's used most often is they were bold. And they turned the world upside down because of their boldness. But there are other manifestations as well. So when we insist that everybody in, in, in the body has to exhibit any one manifestation, then I'm abusing that teaching. Um, the next slide. When I make manifestations more important than love, that comes out at the end of chapter 12 and at the beginning of chapter 13, the love chapter. When the manifestations become more important than good old agape love, then I'm off track. When I exercise manifestations without love, that's just a corollary to there. You know, that's the one, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, you know, if I uh, have, when I know all, I have all knowledge and understand all mysteries, when I give my body to be burned, if I do all of these things, but if I do them without love, it profits nothing. When I encourage or allow uninterpreted tongues messages, now let's talk about that just for a minute here. Um, tongues messages may be given in, a, in, in the body of Christ. They're basically, as I see it, and I won't die on this hill either, but I think there are two uses of tongues in scripture. One are tongues messages to edify the body and they need to be interpreted. The other is praying in tongues, which is a private between you and God. So there are those two. The tongues in privacy, the praying, you won't understand that. That's what Romans 8 says. The Holy Spirit even groans through you sometimes when you don't know how to pray. You know, and I'll tell you when, for me, this manifestation of tongues, it occurs occasionally in me. It's usually when I'm praying for healing for somebody because I don't just automatically assume I always know what God wants to do in every person. So when we don't know, then we trust God to pray through us. So that's the praying in tongues. But if it's a public tongues message, according to these two verses, um, uh, where, where am I? Yeah, verses five and 28 of chapter 14, it needs to be interpreted. And Paul says, I would rather that you prophesy because that doesn't need to be interpreted. That's in the language that you'll understand. When I'm not seeking to edify the body, boy, this is an important one, verses 12, 17, and 26. If, if my manifestation, whatever it is, not just tongues here, but any manifestation, is not seeking to bless the body of Christ, if I'm doing it to call attention to myself, for example, then that is not, that, then I'm abusing the, the, the pneumatica when I'm not seeking to edify the body, or when I give promise, prominence to ecstasy over instruction. And not, not to rule out ecstasy, but instruction, Paul says, that's what the church needs. The church needs proper teaching and instruction. And then the last slide, sensitivity to abuse. When I am, uh, I think there's one more slide that could go up there. When I am insensitive to novices or unbelievers, 
And that's a curious verse, this one, because in one sense, it seems like if they come in and they sense the pneumatica happening, they're gonna say, whoa, God is here. On the other hand, they might say, wow, what a bunch of wackos. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't understand, they're novices. So we need to be sensitive, not to let it you know, inhibit us entirely, but be sensitive to the fact that we're gonna have novices and unbelievers. When more than three speak in tongues in a meeting, in terms of a tongues message, that's very clear in scripture. And yet I'm in services from time to time where people are encouraged to speak out in tongues, tongues messages I'm talking about, not praying in tongues, you know, but more than three. Paul makes it really clear, not more than three in one message, in one service. And then also when more than one at a time speaks in tongues, because if it's going to be a tongues message, there needs to be enough attention to it that the person who's going to interpret it can hear it. And if there are a whole lot of people speaking in tongues at the same time, there won't be an adequate opportunity for interpretation. So Paul says, okay, no more than three in any service and no more than one at a time. Those are really clear in scripture, but they're violated often in some of the churches that I've gone to. When a prophet is not subject to other prophets, <laughs> that's probably the only people they'll be subject to. I'm saying that with tongue in cheek, but prophets do need to be subject to other prophets. And, you know, and when you find a prophet who, who has humility and who is teachable and, and you know, th what a great gift that is to the body of Christ. And then when confusion reigns rather than peace and order at the end of chapter 14, when confusion reigns rather than peace and order. So these are all abuses of the pneumatica that are listed in in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. And again, as we said earlier on, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is really more about manifestations than it is spiritual gifts. I think I've kept you way too long. You've been very patient. I hope this has been helpful. Again, I just wanna say, whatever is supported by the word of God, cling to it, build your life on it. Whatever is not, that may be just my own curious ways of thinking, discard it, please. <laughs> so, Bishop, anything else to be said here? Thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful to be with you. It really is. It really is. Thank you.